And we are fortunate to have four very distinguished entrepreneurs with us who have founded companies themselves. I want to introduce each one of them. I'll do it in alphabetical order, so I don't show any preference here. Steve Case, you all know Steve Case. Uh, he is chairman and CEO of Revolution. I expect everybody knows here. Marjorie Krauss, number two, is founder and chairman of APCO Worldwide, an organization I've been following since the mid-80s when it was founded. It's a global advisory and advocacy communications firm based in D.C., and she has built that thing into a multinational uh, organization right throughout the Americas, as well as the Middle East, Africa, and Asia. We are waiting, I believe, for Jer Jane Werwand, who is co-founder and chief visionary for Dermalogical. That's the skincare company, and they have launched as well financial independence through entrepreneurship. I hope that Jane will be joining us shortly. But in the meantime, Sam Zell, whose name st ends, starts with a Z, so he comes in last. He is a legendary, I think it's fair to say, global entrepreneur investor. He founded has grown multi-billion dollar companies. He sponsors several entrepreneurship programs uh, in, in, in the start of hundreds of companies, actually. Several of them valued at more than a billion dollars. And Forbes tells us that Sam is one of the 100 greatest livest, living business minds. So welcome all to all of you. Thank you for being here. Uh, I'll sort of initiate this discussion, but I expect you all to take it over because <laughs> as you are entrepreneurs, so I suspect you have some gumption. So let me start, Steve, with you, if I could. Uh, as we talk about the American dream and the promise held out from it, uh, you both founded AOL a while ago now and have kept really current with entrepreneurs and developing over the time. How has the climate changed over your time in dealing with starting companies? Well, I think for a lot of people, it's gotten easier to start, but maybe it's harder to scale. Uh, but even the easier to start kind of depends on where you live and, and kind of your, your background. It, right now, uh, if you look at where the venture capital dollars are, over 75% of those dollars go to just three states, California, New York, and Massachusetts. So the other 47 states, including where I am in Virginia or where Sam is in Illinois or, or you know, uh, Michigan, states like that, you get one-ish one percent. Uh, and so it's harder if you're not in Silicon Valley, if you're not in New York City, if you're not in in Boston. It's also hard if you're a woman. Fifty percent of our the population of the country is women, but less than 10 percent of venture capital goes to women. It's harder if you're black. Thirteen percent of Americans are black, but less than one percent of the venture capital goes to black founders. So in terms of the American dream, I think we have some work to do to really level the playing field, have a more inclusive innovation economy and make it so you know, anybody anywhere really does have a shot at the American dream, a shot at creating a company, a shot at creating wealth, a shot at creating jobs, a shot at lifting up their uh, their community. So we, we, we still a lot of work to do on a lot of fronts. So, Marjorie, I noticed you nodding your head when Steve yeah. said it's harder for women. Address that issue, both whether it's harder today, but also has that improved over your time? Well, I think it has improved. Um, but I think that one piece that probably hasn't changed all that much is what Steve was saying about access to capital. I mean, I had to bootstrap what I did and uh, kind of go hand to mouth. And I could have gotten to scale a lot faster uh, if I had resources. But I was funding this company out of our own profits. Uh, we're now 900 people. So, I mean, it's but it took a while to get there. I was the only person when we started. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things I have found is um, when I've gone out for capital now, after... 37 years of a track record, I've even had some people still say, you have to sign a personal guarantee, which is outrageous. Nobody would, I mean, you know, with a track record and paid every bill on time over the years to have anybody even say that is, is ridiculous um, when, you've, when you've had proof of concept and, and you've done that over the years. So it just takes a lot. I think it takes a lot more, I don't want to say it this way, but grit. Um, you know, you have to just be uh, unabashedly uh, stubborn if you're going to uh, do that. And, and one of the things I've learned is um, that, you know, never to underestimate the power of being underestimated mm -hmm. because it's the only way I've survived. <laughs> Sam, Zell, talk to us about capital, uh, because it strikes me that certainly since 2008, 2009,
the capital is very plentiful. Uh, but having said that, um, I'm not sure that, you know, minimal, min, minimum interest rates are good for the economy. Uh, you know, I read a, a report by Jim Grant who writes on interest rates, and he talked about the fact that, uh, you know, somebody referred to, uh, you know, interest rates as uh, the shot clock in basketball. Hmm. That, uh, you know, I think in 1956, uh, you know, the Minneapolis Lakers beat the Syracuse Nationals 18 to 17. And the next day, the shot clock began. Uh, I think interest rates are a function of urgency. And, uh, and in the reverse, uh, I think that they could, you know, lead to lethargy. So I'm, you know, even though there is for sure, uh, an, an oversupply, of capital, uh, but I'm not, not sure that something like what we saw in GameStop last week uh, or the week before is not really a function of there being too much capital and without intelligent ways to put it to use. So, Steve, I want to pick up on that, actually, it's something I'm sort of curious about. When you do have really inexpensive capital, it allows some companies to keep going past their normal lives. They otherwise, would have to consolidate something else. Does that soak up some of the talent and the money that otherwise might be available to the startups? Are we getting fewer startups these days because some of the companies are hanging on longer than they normally would? Well, I think the market's pretty efficient, so it's pretty hard to keep raising capital uh, if you're you're not getting traction in in, in the market. Uh, there, in fact, the tendency is for venture capitalists to take too much of a short term. Uh, mentality, unless it's really working quickly, sometimes they just move on to the, the, the next thing. So it's pretty brutal, pretty Darwinian in that sense. But I think it's also a t- worth taking a step back and recognizing that when we talk about the business world or talk about the private sector, uh, there's really three separate areas that, that sometimes get conflated. One are what's happening with small businesses, and particularly in the pandem- pandemic, obviously, a lot have been really uh, challenged. One's happening with big businesses, the Fortune 500 companies in particular, and then what's happening with new businesses, the startups and the real job creators in the country are mostly the new businesses, those, those uh, startups and those startups, because it's more of an idea, aren't able to borrow money from uh, from banks. It's still more of a concept as opposed to uh, a reality, which is why having the venture capital go to more people in more places is so important. If we do have a more inclusive innovation economy, we have more people in the country feeling like they, they really do have a shot, not just in terms of entrepreneurs starting companies, but also people able to join companies that are on the rise and and be living in cities that are on the rise as opposed to you know, cities on, on the decline. Well, it's interesting, Jan. I'm, I'm curious, Marjorie, what you think about small business, uh, because a lot of the startups, by definition, are small business when they start out. Is it possible? Is it possible to have too much money when you're starting out? I, I have to confess, <laughs> self-disclosure here, I actually ran a small startup after I left ABC News, and, and it did not do well in part because there was too much money in it, and as a result, people made some bad decisions. Well, I never had that experience, so <laughs> to say, but I will say, you know, the other thing I do, um, because I believe in playing it forward, is I'm the chair of Women Presidents Organization. It's 2,200 women-owned businesses, and some of them are million-dollar businesses, some of them are half a billion-dollar businesses, but they're all women who have started their own businesses and are moving them forward. And I would say the collective experience of that group, just not just my own experience, is that, um, you know, these are not businesses that have had too much capital. But I think when capital comes easy, um, it's easy to, it's, it's, you, you don't make decisions quick enough, I mm. think. I think you think you have the room to experiment with a lot more things than maybe you have the, the opportunity to do. So it's not, you know, and, and maybe Steve and, and Sam have another view of that. But as I said, I don't have the, I've never had the luxury of having that problem. Uh, but I do think it's important to be very focused and very um, purposeful on where you, you know, making the decisions about where you are putting capital, where you are putting energy and to be very, you know, focused on getting that right. So, I think you know, that's the jump in, there's, there's a dynamic that building on what Marjorie is saying that I think is worth pointing out, which is I talked about sort of where the capital is in terms of place and, and, and also in terms of where it is in terms of people. But what typically happens in the venture capital world is people say, if you have an idea, the first thing you do is do like a friends and family round to raise some initial seed capital to get it going. 
Well, guess what? A lot of people don't have the friends and family around them that can fund that. You maybe if you you know went to Stanford and just spent a few years at Facebook and you you made some money on your options and you have a bunch of other people that did that as well. Well, it's relatively easy to put that friends and family around together. But in many parts of the country and for many people in the country, it's actually quite hard, and they never have the ability to take their idea and give it a real shot in the in the marketplace. And I think that's one reason it's so unequal. Also. You know, you talked, um, Steve, about the difference between, you know, the, the, the lack of diversity maybe in the entrepreneurial class of people. And I think that's part of it is that, you know, you have to be able to provide for your family while you're doing this. If you don't have a place to go for capital to test your idea or to get started, I think that that's part of the issue of uh, that creates this disparity. Sam, what about that? Sorry. Yeah, I mean, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Tim. I got a problem with this whole stream of discussion. Uh, I run a whole bunch of, you know, entrepreneurial programs. Uh, I remember in 1979 uh, sitting with the dean of the Michigan Business School, and uh, and I just read his curricula, and uh, I asked him how could there be a curriculum of a university MBA program that did not have the word entrepreneur in it, and it did. And I've worked on creating programs in that direction. I think that my experience has been, for example, uh, as it related to women, uh, the, the, the number of women that were initially attracted to the entrepreneurial area was very limited. Uh, fast forward to 2020, uh, 50% of our entrepreneurial programs are populated by women. And I think it's very likely that, uh, you know, they will be able to access capital uh, the same way males do so uh, in this in, in, in this current environment. Uh, I think that the excessive amount of capital available uh, is creating uh, distortions in value and distortions in pricing. And, you know, just take the unicorns as an example. The unicorns were companies over a billion dollars that were still private. Uh, I would say that the unicorns were deliberately created to obfuscate price discovery. Uh, no better example of that than we were. Uh, the, the investors in we were kept, you know, adding just a little more money at a higher valuation to create valuation, not to create value. So I think all of this re revolves around discipline. Uh, you know, your comment about uh, being asked to personally sign, uh, it just happened to me the other day. And uh, and so uh, you shouldn't feel like the Lone Ranger. Everybody wants to get paid back. And, and by the way, everybody asks for as much collateral and as much security as they possibly can get. Now, they may get turned down, which I'm sure you did and I did. But uh, being asked uh, is not an insult. It's probably a, an accolade to you know, you know, to to the fact that they're willing to give you money. Period. Uh, so, so, Sam, so Sam, why why it sounds like your program, if it's fifty fifty, is is great. But why do you think the data from last year in terms of venture capital is so skewed? Even though, as I said, fifty percent of the population is women, less than ten percent of venture capital goes to women. Why do you think that is? And what are you doing with your program to make sure it is fifty fifty, not just in terms of who's in the program? but the company's coming out of the program? Well, it starts with the number of applications. Uh, it starts with the number of women that are interested in pursuing venture capital. And uh, and what we've found is that, I look back, we're just celebrating our 20th anniversary. And, uh, you know, in, in 20 years ago, we had very few women. Uh, those few women uh, were there for, you know, took 20 years for the ecosystem to grow. I think if we were sitting here 10 years from now, the numbers that you're referring to uh, would be significantly different. No different than, you know, when I grew up, uh, you know, 90 or whatever, 75% of the women stayed home. Uh, that's been reversed. Uh, I think, you know, we shouldn't be so impatient. And, uh, and I think that, uh, you know, I worry about, uh, uh, you know, creating and urging uh, uh, overactivity without uh, the disciplines necessary to make it worthwhile. 
Oh, oh, Marjorie, I, I want to ask oh, you a question. Oh, okay, ahead, I'm just going to yeah. come back um, to something that um, related to the, the number of women coming in as entrepreneurs. I think the one thing that has really changed, I think women, and, and some of this is the, the, um, the kind of environment and, and corporations that a lot of women have decided for, for all kinds of reasons that they, they want to uh, go and try something on their own. So that number is increasing. And there is, it's a lot different than it was before. But I think the access to capital is still one of those issues. And, you know, and I agree with Sam. I mean, if we live long enough, things will change. But some of us are a little impatient. So, Marjorie, let me ask you a question that's related to something, a comment that we're getting actually from a viewer right now. Uh, that is something I have read about before, and that is health care whether the availability or lack of availability of healthcare actually may affect how many people can be entrepreneurs. In Europe, this person is saying where they've started a bunch of companies, it's much easier because there's a healthcare social safety net underlying you. And so you can take more risks than in the United States where we have more of, I think it's fair, a spotty uh, healthcare system. Does that ring true to you? You have operations around the world. Oh, yeah. Well, I think that the kind of support system that exists in society and other places, whether it's childcare or healthcare, is much better in certain parts of the world than the U.S. Um, but I, I don't know if that is the determining factor. I think if people are taking a risk, uh, I don't know how many people are held back because they're concerned about that particular uh, thing. Although it is another factor because healthcare you know, insurance is so expensive if you're on your own, uh, rather than being part of a, a bigger group. Isn't it, no, wouldn't it also be true to applicable to eating? <laughs> eating? eating? Yeah, I mean, I mean that, that's expensive too. I mean, I, and it, I'm just, I'm, people are looking for things to hang their hat on. And uh, I'm, just, I'm just sitting here saying, sure, being an entrepreneur is very expensive. It's very risky. It is uh, you got to eat and you got to have health care. And you probably have to have some other use things too, but that's part of the risk of being an entrepreneur. And, you know, there are lots and lots of examples, both men and women, of people who can affect, in effect, test their limits, uh, because their, 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 their desire is, 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 is what makes it work. I mean, when I interview people for jobs, one of the questions I ask them is, how hungry are you? And uh, that, you know, and that really determines that, you know, the, to the success ratio is much more related to hunger than it is to IQ. Uh, Steve, when we talk about healthcare, I have to talk to you because you have a lot of experience and knowledge in this area. And I'm curious about your view on that. But I, I want to expand it out actually a little bit. We haven't talked yet about one of the big events, uh, right, of the last year, just a little over a year now, the pandemic. I mean, how have you found that the pandemic may have affected one way or the other entrepreneurship? Well, first on healthcare, I think it's system, uh, certainly in our country, but other countries around the world, uh, need real disruption, real, need real innovation. Right now, it is still, you know, does not working so well. It's, it's expensive. It's inconvenient. Outcomes are sometimes spotty. Even MD Anderson says when people come there for second opinions, 25% of the time they reverse the first opinion. So there's a lot of work to be done to improve that system. Actually, one company we backed, Revolution backed in Chicago, Samstown, you know, Tempest is, is focused on that and doing great work. In terms of the pandemic itself, uh, it's obviously started as a very big challenge for a, a lot of entrepreneurs. Some struggled, some didn't didn't make it but if the, the ones who did get through building on sam's point about kind of grit and perseverance and and are actually using this as an opportunity to kind of rethink and reimagine are coming out of it even stronger than they were before there are many examples of that of, of entrepreneurs we backed that a year ago things were looking a little dicey now they actually have used this as an opportunity to reimagine examples a company called clear that many, many know from a airport kind of fast path in the last year they built a health pass in terms of a vaccine passport actually just announced yesterday a partnership with, with walmart that's rolling it out uh, that's in part fueled by the pandemic and their core business around uh, airplanes obviously wasn't the same as it was they used that this last year to reimagine uh, their their business and that's the great thing about entrepreneurs they always are looking for new ways new ideas better ways to do things so I see, I'm delighted to say, uh, I see Jay Werwan there now. And so Jane, we introduced you at the top. She is, of course, the co-founder of Dermalogical. Welcome. I think uh, by my reckoning, you have about 15 minutes. You can just talk straight now. <laughs> we'll all be quiet. Sure. Have to say. 
but but thanks for being. But you 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 make small. You're involved in an organization making small loans, as I understand, to female entrepreneurs in like 68 different countries. Uh, how how have you seen the pandemic affect that business or not? <laughs> Well, actually, we're focused right now uh, through our nonprofit found on local businesses. So, you know, Dermalogica built its success on small salons in, in local town centers. And those are the entrepreneurs that brought us to the, to the you know, to the success that we had. Mm-hmm. I am an entrepreneur. I, I'm an immigrant uh, and, a, and a woman. And it was impossible to get funded. So we started on $14,000 of self-funding and self-funded all the way through to an acquisition by Unilever. So I know how it is to be an entrepreneur, but I also know those main street entrepreneurs. And that's what we focus on at Found, which is basically finding the invisible entrepreneurs, not the companies that everyone knows, but the high street, main street, whether it's a a bakery, a coffee shop, a mechanic, a dog groomer. We're, We're looking at those businesses that aren't getting funded. They're in underserved communities. They're normally using three credit cards to fund $28,000 to start their business. And we predict that a great many of them will not be back. P loans missed them. They fell through the cracks because they didn't have the banking relationships that mid-sized businesses and larger businesses had. So we've got a dire situation on our main streets, and that is the long tail of job creation. You know, fifty uh, percent of all jobs come from those those small entrepreneurs, and if they are not built back, we lose our neighborhoods and communities. So we just launched uh, a fund. Uh, we're in our fourth round of million dollar funding in Los Angeles because we were very hard hit. So, so Sam, I'd like to come back to you because you do work with a lot of young entrepreneurs. Do they find you or you find them and how? Uh, they generally find me. Um, we run three programs, uh, one in Israel, one in Northwestern, and one in Michigan. Uh, they all you know, attract entrepreneur, young entrepreneurs, uh, uh, you know, somewhere in their 20s and, and in various stages, uh, you know, but... But in effect, it still comes down to drive. I mean, you know, Marjorie was talking before about how she's built her company. Well, you know, it starts with, you know, Marjorie. I mean, Marjorie is, you know, in order to have done that, you've got to be an, you know, an awfully tough person. I think that's true of starting AOL or any other company or Dermology. You know, I mean, you know, I, think, I think we're trying to, uh, you know, make this entrepreneurial process into something simpler. And it ain't simple. And that's why the entrepreneurs get rewarded accordingly. And uh, I just think that we got to be realistic about the fact that, you know, that there's a difference between an entrepreneur and a non-entrepreneur. And, uh, you know, a lot of it deals with who's working all night and who's starting their business with credit cards. Uh, I think. Bill Gates and Steve Wojcik started Microsoft, you know, on, on credit card debt. There's been lots of companies that have started like that. And it, and it all comes down to the people and the drive of the people. And, uh, and we have encouraged people with drive to go for it. You know, that's, that's, that's the role we should play, not try and uh, mix and match and make sure that the color of the skin is the same for every one of them. Uh, the answer is achieve, achieve success and, 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 uh, and the American dream will, will finance it. And they have. Now, pandemic has created a, a, a pretty extraordinary, uh, you know, set of circumstances. Um, and, uh, you know, and, the government has, in some respects, been, uh, you know, reflective of that and done reasonably well at it. In other cases, uh, you know, they've turned, uh, you know, ep- you know, pandemic relief into political relief and funded a lot of stuff that uh, I think doesn't fit the objective. Uh, frankly, funded people at levels. Uh, you know, the idea that uh, if you're making one hundred and fifty thousand dollars at a couple, you get as a couple, you get uh, twenty hundred dollars cash. 
uh, that's hard to figure out. And that's hard to suggest that that creates the kind of incentives and disciplines that make our society work. So, so Sam, just to just to correct something that Microsoft and Apple, two fabulous companies, absolutely uh, were successful because of passion and drive and grit and so forth. But Bill Gates actually came from a wealthy family in Seattle and was at Harvard and, and, and you know, was not like a credit card thing. And Apple was not funded by Steve Wozniak credit cards, funded by venture capitalists, which is why we need to figure out ways to get capital to people who don't didn't grow, grow up with it uh, or don't have access to people who have access to capital. So you, you know, obviously you're in a, in, a, in, a, in a very privileged position because of your success. And now you're, you're helping a, ne- the next generation of entrepreneurs. It's just terrific. But you mentioned the three programs you're backing. There's you know, hundreds of other parts of this, this country and thousands of other parts of this world that don't have a Sam Zell uh, providing that initial uh, inspiration and capital. Well, I'm hoping I'm setting an example. I hope okay. so too. And I hope that the funding starts going, you know, less than 4% of all funding, not just venture capital, not just private equity funding, but or any and all funding goes to women, minorities and underserved communities. We're just not, we're just not seeing it, even though all the data shows that when you have uh, diversity, including women, obviously in a company or as an entrepreneur, they do better. We're starting companies at one and a half times the rate of men, and yet we're not getting the funding. So we have to look at that because, trust me, I know plenty of entrepreneurs with grit and determination, and they just can't make it over that first hill. So we we have to figure out a way to just get them the funding. They don't want to hand out. They want to hand up. Marjorie, I'd like to pick up on what Sam was talking about. And to some extent, Steve, as you work with young entrepreneurs, how do you pick the ones you think uh, you should back? Uh, or, or do you? Do you do you try to look at them and say, I think that one's going to make it and that one's not? I mean, I must say, when I was making personal de- nail decisions in a big corporation, I was not very good at it. I mean, there are so many times that I was sure something would work out and it didn't, or I was sure it wouldn't work out and it did. How do you do it with entrepreneurs? Can you recognize at an early stage whether they'll work? Is it drive and grit and determination the way Sam says? Who are you directing that to? Marjorie. Marjorie. No. To, to me? Yep. Because I'm not funding entrepreneurs. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm building a business. Um, I'm working with other women as they have their, their difficulties through W, you know, WBO. But I, I do think it takes a certain kind of um, spirit and a certain kind of grit. But I agree with what, um, you know, what uh, has been said about access to capital because. You know, I'm an immigrant also, so my parents weren't about to give, you know, I, I didn't have to earn my way through school and, and uh, start on my own. And I started life as a high school teacher. So when I went into this world, and I've always had entrepreneurial instincts, um, it, it was just hard to, um, you know, you have good ideas, people get excited about those ideas, but, you know, making making the p l work so that there's a little bit left to reinvest and to take care of your people at the same time. That's a hard way to build a business. Um, you know, especially on a surface business, you know, it's not like you can ramp up the, you know, crank out more product or something like that. So, um, you know, so I, I think it, I think it is difficult. And I, I do think that, um, and I applaud what Sam is doing and I understand what he's saying. Um, I just wish there were more people like Sam with resources to um, help identify. Uh, I don't I don't doubt that people should be funded just because they want to be funded or they think they're entrepreneurs. I think, you know, it takes a certain kind of spirit. But even having all of those elements together, it still takes real hard work to try to get funding. So, Jane, let me come back to you because you laid out the statistics there on funding. Um, yeah. Why? Why do you think that is? Well, I think I think a great part is who's going to who's going to fund us. That's the thing. And so if you if we're relying on traditional funding methods, it's very hard to, you know, you, if you're pitching ideas and you've got your, your idea and your, your business plan and you're going in front of people that don't understand the fundamental of your idea because perhaps they don't relate to it in any way. It's going to be hard to get funding. I think there's conscious bias and I think there's unconscious bias. So we have to look at different levels, different tiers of funding. So we look for local entrepreneurs with found and uh, we work through community funders 
We work through, uh, we work with people like the Opportunity Fund with uh, Pacific Community Ventures. And we are constantly looking for who are the local entrepreneurs that need help that are hidden, that without them, we don't have neighborhoods that are the businesses that we want to live near and frequent. I mean, I think it's fantastic that Amazon are doing so well online, but I don't want to live next to that warehouse. I want to live near a high street which has a bakery and, and a coffee shop and a restaurant and people that know my name. I mean, it sounds very traditional, but that is the American dream. And that is the way that most entrepreneurs start. And I think it comes back to education always. I think that we need skill set training and apprenticeships begun even in our high schools so that instead of just graduating with a with a GED, you graduate with an apprenticeship program and an ability to start working. And not just apprenticeships in large corporations, but apprenticeships in local businesses. And how do we incentivize them to offer them? And then how do we get them funded? And it's going to come from local funders who understand the community. I think everyone who can step up, whether it's a non-profit, whether it's a for-profit, whether it is family foundations or people who have had success as entrepreneurs and are willing to do that, I think we need all hands on deck because we're, we're lagging behind in a lot of critical innovation in the States. And one of our key elements, I know Steve was with me with President Obama as a, as a presidential ambassador for global entrepreneurship. It's one of our key exports is entrepreneurship. We have the, the moxie. We have the wherewithal. We just got to get the education and the funding to the right communities. Well, let's talk about that education. Steve, I'll come back to you on that. Uh, can you teach entrepreneurship in a traditional formal setting? Sam said that he once upgraded, I think it was the dean of the business school, right, at Michigan, Sam, you said, saying, why don't you even have entrepreneur in any of your catalog here? Is it something you can teach in a formal setting? I think you can teach it. Not everybody is going to end up being an entrepreneur, but, but exposing people to the idea of entrepreneurship and giving them some basic uh, tools to consider a path as an entrepreneur or join another entrepreneur in starting and scaling a, a, a company. It's not just a, sometimes too much focus on the entrepreneur. And I, one thing I've learned is entrepreneurship really is a team sport. So assembling yeah. the right team makes sense. So it may not be you came up with the idea, but perhaps you can provide some help in terms of the sales function or uh, some technology function or or some strategic partnerships. And so it really takes a, a number of people coming together with complementary skills to build a, a success. But for a lot of people, to your question, David, and they're growing up, they, they've never heard the word entrepreneurship. They don't really know what it is. They don't really know that's a path available to them. So giving people that exposure and, and uh, some tools to at least consider if they have an idea how they might turn it into a company, I think is important. So Sam, yeah. what did the Michigan Business School do in response to your admonition? Well, they didn't do much. Uh, I, you know, I, I convinced them to uh, start a program where we ran a national contest, uh, inviting uh, somebody to write a syllabus on entrepreneurship. And uh, we offered a $25,000 prize and a one year appointment to teach the course that they created. And uh, we had some very interesting winners. I mean, the first winner uh, was a, a music school professor who basically talked about composing <laughs> as a form of entrepreneurship. Wow. And it was a fascinating way to look at entrepreneurship. We had a professor uh, from an engineering professor uh, who basically, you know, wrote a, wrote a program, uh, a syllabus, that was called Failure 101. And his thesis was that you couldn't really be an entrepreneur and a successful one unless you dealt with rejection and unless you failed and unless you were able to, to in effect, you know, exempt the word failure from your lexicon and instead accept things that just didn't work out. But that's what an entrepreneur does. An entrepreneur sees problems but an entrepreneur also sees the solution. And that's what differentiates the successful from the non-successful entrepreneur. So I think it, I think it, it can be taught, uh, not so much as an academic program, but as a, as Harvard does in their case studies, you know, where you in effect set an example, you establish what people have done and, and then share that experience until it lights up somebody to do something about it. And I think that that's, that's the most effective way of teaching entrepreneurship. 
I think one thing that would be important to also um, in a course like that too is we have to be careful we don't over glamorize uh, what it is to be an entrepreneur. I think for the people who um, who have it in their blood, I mean, I wouldn't have traded what I've done for anything. I mean, it was a it's been a fantastic learning opportunity, and there are moments you're down and moments you're up, but you know, if you believe in what you're doing, then it's 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 part of what you do every day. It gives you the energy and the drive. But for some people, it's really difficult. And um, some people, you know, it, you, you can't just look at kind of the outcomes. You also have to understand kind of what it takes and and to make sure that people who get into this understand that not every day is sunny. And, and let's start the conversation earlier. Let's start the conversation in middle school uh, and not wait until somebody ends up in a university because many people are not going to be in a university that are going to be entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship offers them an incredible opportunity. But as we said, they necessarily don't know anything about it. But if we start the conversation and we're teaching coding in, in elementary school, if we start the conversation of here are the different things that you could be doing in your life, and one is going to university, one is becoming, uh, you know, skill set trained, one is becoming an entrepreneur with either of those two things. And if we're teaching skills in school, we should be teaching what those skills could lead to. And I think that's when the conversation needs to start so that we can start thinking, hey, maybe, you know, I think I have the, the grit to do it. I want to go for it. And with, then we could teach them how do they get funded, and, and it doesn't necessarily depend on, on doing their MBA. So one of the major developments before the pandemic, at least, was globalization. I mean, it was under some siege, perhaps, under uh, President Trump, but basically we're moving toward globalization. And we presume that some version of that's going to come back. How does that affect entrepreneurship? Does it make it easier? Does it make it harder that, to some extent, you can market around the world to communicate, but you're also competing with the world? often in a lot of respects. Steve, do you want to take that? No, we're absolutely seeing uh, the, essentially the globalization of entrepreneurship. 25 years ago, over 90% of the world's venture capital went to the United States. Now it's under 50%. Uh, so it's already happening. I and mean, what we're expecting to see also and hoping to see, it's why we launched this Rise of the Rest effort a number of years ago, is getting some of the venture capital within the United States on the coast to going other parts of the, the country. How do you level the playing field uh, there? So my hope is we'll see, we're already seeing the global of entrepreneurship. We also want to see the regionalization of entrepreneurship. And that's really critical to this key theme of this, of this, uh, uh, this, 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 this session on the American dream. It's not just what the companies are doing. It's how those companies, as they are growing, are creating other jobs in the community. For every startup job, there's usually five other jobs in the community. I saw this with AOL when we went from dozens of people to hundreds of people to thousands of people in the northern Virginia area. Suddenly houses were being built and schools were being built and restaurants were being uh, built to support that expanding community. Conversely, when you start losing that edge, as to, as, as we saw in uh in Detroit, which 100 years ago was sort of like Silicon Valley, but then in the last half century lost 60% of its population and went bankrupt. When they lost that entrepreneurial mojo, people were fleeing and, and a lot of those businesses were, were closing. So it's these startups, these new companies have to be started everywhere to have this ripple effect in communities everywhere. Yeah. So what about it, Sam? What about the globalization of entrepreneurship? Does that make sense? Well, I, I think it's nothing new. I think it's been going on since the beginning of time. Uh, uh, we've just, you know, expanded the definition of entrepreneur. Uh, you know, it starts with the, the guys, you know, selling, uh, you know, hot sizzling meat on the streets of India. Uh, he's an entrepreneur. And, uh, and then he got a second store and a third store and uh, or a third location. That's what entrepreneurs are like. I think that's been going on since the beginning of time to the extent that we create an atmosphere. I agree with Steve. I mean, you know, we've done this program for 20 years in Israel. And uh, in, in Israel is a Petri dish for entrepreneurial activity. Uh, and it's built into the culture as a result. Uh, we need to build it into the culture. And uh, we need to encourage it. And I think, you know, that that's terrific as long as we don't create a false sense of, uh, of, of comfort uh, by flooding it with capital and, and lowering the standards for what is a successful entrepreneurial activity. 
So just as a point of personal privilege, because I'm a Michigander, I'm from Flint originally. I know Sam went to Michigan Law School the way I did. We did have one comment to Steve saying Detroit is coming back. I know it's Steve definitely knows coming that. back. No, we are coming back. back. Yeah. I think eight companies in Detroit, including StockX, which has grown like you know yeah. has hundreds and hundreds of employees, and Shinola. No, absolutely, it's coming back, and it's a great uh, story of a community a that watch on right there. Rising again. That's a Shinola watch right there. Well, thank you. Really. Thanks for the thanks for the support. I love, I love Chanel. I love Chanel. So, so let's just, just try to wrap this up here. Uh, go to the ultimate question, which is the subject of the panel, the American dream. And I guess my question, and this is a difficult one to answer in short compass, uh, is do you think that there's still the same promise for the entrepreneur that start up today as there was a generation ago in the United States of America? Because there's a lot of talk about we don't think the next generation is going to have it as good as the last for the first time ever. Do you think it's still there? Marjorie, you built it based on the, on, on the American dream. What do you think? Oh, I, I definitely think it's there. I think, you know, I, I, you have to find it, but it's it's there. I I, I mean, I, I kind of feel like that's what happened to me. And um, I think the, um, the, you, you talked about COVID before. I think COVID is also a good example of that the American dream is alive and well. <clears throat> We're coming out of this because of science, but it, there is a uh, I've, we've been approached by a lot of smaller companies that are just starting that have all kinds of interesting technologies that grew out of solutions, uh, either for the pandemic or things to be done differently going forward. So I see every day um, some, you know, really thoughtful, interesting thoughtful. ideas that hopefully will fuel the future. Jane, you have a unique perspective in this regard as you uh, self-identified immigrant. Uh, what yeah. are you making the American dream of where it stands today? Listen, that's what brought me here with a suitcase in my hand and my beauty school diploma rolled up inside it to pursue the American dream. And yes, I absolutely think so. I think we've also got to pay attention, though, that America stays forward thinking always and leads in innovation. And we have to lead in global innovation, whether it's AI or whether it's, you know, 5G. We've got to make sure that we're staying a ahead and being competitive. And this is not political, but it's competitive. I mean, we, we have to have that edge because that's what built the American dream was this idea of opportunity. And if we start becoming a country that's different and isn't as embracing of immigrants and isn't pursuing innovation and technology globally, we're going to fall behind. And that those, that dream will be, belong to a different country. And there's no reason and why it should, because I believe we have the biggest potential in the world. Steve, the biggest competitor maybe for the United States these days economically is China, which is certainly gaining on us. Is China gaining on us in innovation, do you think? Yes, yes. Now, a lot of people 10, 15 years ago said China is really good at kind of replicating copying, but not particularly good at innovating. In a lot of sectors, including AI, uh, they have done a lot of things that are that are quite uh, innovative. So it's definitely a reason to be concerned. But my view is the American dream is, is, is alive, but it's not alive for everybody. And that's why part of what we need to do is create a more inclusive innovation economy. So it's not just certain parts of the country, not just for certain people. It really is much more of, as I talked about earlier, uh, a level playing field. America led the way in, in the agricultural revolution, then led the way in the industrial revolution, led the way in the technology revolution. We certainly can lead the way in the next revolution, but we can't do it if we only have certain people on the playing field. We need to make sure everybody has a shot at that American dream. So, so Sam, it strikes me that you have lived not one, but maybe four, five, ten American dreams in your lifetime. What do you make of it at this point? I mean, do you think it's in jeopardy? Um, no, I don't. Uh, you know, I, I do a lot of public speaking uh, at every every session I've ever done. The last question is always, you know, it's really interesting to hear you talk, Sam. But when you started out, things were so much easier and there was so much greater opportunity than I'm looking at today. Uh, I think people who have that attitude ain't going to make it. Uh, I think that uh, America still is the, the land of opportunity. Uh, one of its strengths is that uh, it's created the least barriers uh, to create the kind of entrepreneurial uh, environment we're talking about. Uh, however, however, those statistics you quote are, Steve, uh, I think they're a lot less other places than they are here. Uh, so I think that uh, everybody is uh, looking for reasons, uh, you know, that it's more difficult. It's just difficult. It's different kinds of opportunities, uh, different kinds of challenges. But, you know, you look at, look at, uh, you know, 
but somebody created these Google, somebody created these companies uh, uh, off of ideas and, and were supported accordingly. And we've had women entrepreneurs that have done the same, as evidenced by the two on this panel. Okay, that concludes our time. I see a little message across my screen as best I can read it. This says that we're, we've run out of time. I, I really want to thank everybody for watching it, us, all of you out there. I tried to get some, some of the comments as far as I could read them on that tiny screen over there. I'm getting older. Can't quite read it as well. So I want to thank our panelists. I'll try to do it in reverse order, uh, alphabetical order. Sam Zell, thank you so much. Jane, it's great that you joined us. I'm glad you could make it. Marjorie thank and you. Steve Case, wonderful to have you all. Thank you all very much. That concludes this panel for Horasis. Thanks, David. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, David. Bye.